Now uh, it is my great pleasure to move on to our next session, which is really looking uh, at country perspectives around the Beijing Platform for Action. And I would like to introduce a leading Australian voice on women and human rights, um, Dr. Ramona V. Ray Raja, who's at the um, Law School at uh, University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, Ramona um, has a very distinguished uh, career and is working very much right now on a project that's trying to increase uh, domestic level accountability for women's rights. So she's the per perfect person to have uh, as the chair and the discussant for our next session. And so I'll hand it over to you, Ramona, and uh, get you to take us through this next um, excellent panel with new voices in this space. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much uh, to uh, Louise for that introduction and to Hilary and Louise for the privilege of being part of such a stellar group of speakers today. It has been a tremendous morning and a tremendous start to the afternoon. So thank you. This session is focused on country perspectives. So 25 years on from the Beijing Platform for Action, how uh, has Beijing influenced the lives of women at a country level? How are women in the Global South faring? I had the privilege of looking at that question through the lens of three papers, all of which provided case studies. Two of these were country-based. Adiola Adelke from the University of Viloran in Nigeria provides a Nigerian perspective, while Natasha Singh Raghuvanshi from Monash provides an Indian perspective. Lindsay Stevenson Graff from Bond provides a sort of panoramic of Latin America, but with a particular focus on Ecuador. I was a practitioner for 10 years before joining the University of Technology, Sydney, and I've been privileged working for international organisations and local and international NGOs to sit and speak with countless women who've told me stories of harassment and violence, of discrimination, fear and exclusion. And I've seen firsthand this interface between international processes like Beijing and, of course, CEDAW and women's experiences locally. Similarly, these three scholars do an essential job of bringing to this conference and to this discussion an understanding of how women in the Global South are faring. And as you'll see, and I think this is really evident across the whole day's discussion, that there's this very difficult balance between cautious optimism and the more sobering reflections on these persistent gaps between Beijing's rhetoric and its impact at the national level. As you'll hear from these scholars, in reality, Beijing's impact locally has been limited. Um, at the same time, these three scholars do an excellent job of highlighting specific gaps we can focus on, particularly when we look at particular groups of women and girls who are slipping through the cracks. They also offer strategies to guide us as we move forward. What I plan to do in today's presentation is to highlight some key observations that these papers illustrate really well. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the limits of Beijing and bringing about national level change, especially when we talk about the granular details of specific women's experiences how domestic and international law are a key part of the change process, as Diane Otto so well pointed out this morning, and yet even here, progress is uneven and a little slow. And of course, speaking from Sydney, Australia, the importance when we talk about gender equality and country perspectives of looking about a gender equality inequality, both from the perspective of the global north and the global south. But first, uh, let's see the videos from our presenters. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Natasha and I would like to thank you so much for attending my presentation today. The title of my project is Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and Women's Rights in India. In this paper, I ask, how can Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action help protect women's rights and lead to gender equality in India? Guided by a post-colonial and critical feminist approach, the paper contextualizes 25 years history of the Beijing Platform for Action and Indian government's responses to issues faced by women. It also explores civil society response to implementation of platform for action in India. As we all know, Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action has completed 25 years milestone. On this occasion, the UN Secretary General has appreciated the work of young generation of activists and women's movement across the globe. However, he also expressed dismay regarding the partial realization of the Beijing vision. One of the countries where the progress is unequal and slow is in India. While Government of India expresses commitment towards the Beijing platform for action, 
and highlights at the international platform various policies and laws for preserving rights of women and promoting gender equality. In spite of presence of these laws and policies, rights of women in India are violated every day, especially in our areas of armed conflict. India has internal armed conflicts, which the government calls disturbances. They have roots in pre-independence history of India. Militarization is, the part, is part of the state's response to these resistant movements as they are considered a threat to Indian state's pursuit of post-independence nation building agenda. On international platforms such as CEDAW and Beijing Platform for Action Reporting, India denies existence of any internal armed conflict within its territory. This has impacted, severely impacted women and young girls, and they have faced humiliation in terms of rape, sexual torture, and even killing. While Indian government has expressed strong commitment towards the Platform for Action, Despite such commitments, there is constant violation of women's rights in India, especially in relation to women's participation, where women are not, not many women are present in leadership and decision-making positions, budget and access to services. Um, civil society activists have called for incorporation of intersectional lens in gender budgeting. In terms of armed conflict, the government is constantly increasing defense budget spending. There is lack of women in peace negotiation and women are absent in judicial and political leadership, especially in armed conflict. As Beijing Platform for Action completes 25 years of operation, women in India continue to fight for agency and leadership space while facing risk of marginalization and vulnerability. To understand India's real commitment to gender equality and protecting women's rights, we need to look beyond the policy and legislative initiatives. It is important that we engage with the community and aim towards a mindset change towards overall equality and freedom from patriarchal social norms and customs. Thank you so much. I end my presentation here. I look forward to your valuable feedback. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. In Australia, my name is Adiola Adeleke. I am presenting the paper titled Post-1995 Beijing Platform of Action and the Question of Gender Discrimination in Nigeria, Issues and Challenges. I chose this title or this topic because 25 years after the Beijing Declaration, women in Nigeria are still being discriminated against in different spheres of the society. The Beijing Declaration sets a global landmark for women, um, human rights, gender equality, and women empowerment. The Beijing Declaration recognized gender equality as a mandate for all national mechanism. The core argument in this paper is that despite the efforts of the Nigerian government towards integrating women into developmental agenda after the Beijing Declaration, there still persists gender inequality in the society 25 years after the Beijing Declaration. Take, so for example, in the area of political representation in Nigeria, there are less than 10% of women in political representation, but appointive and elective position. Also, women are concentrated more in the small-scale economy, and this has reduced women empowerment. Also, the Beijing Declaration recommended 35% representation of women, which is yet to be achieved in any area of the society in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. The, 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 um, the constitution of the country, there are certain areas of the constitution that discriminate against women. Stereotyping is so common in different areas of socialization in the country. The paper concludes that 
although some progress has been made towards the reduction of discrimination against women, but much work needs to be done for women to achieve gender equality and women empowerment. Therefore, the paper recommends that CEDAR should be put into law by the government of the country. Thank you. During the last 25 years, the inter-American system has developed the most advanced regional jurisprudence with respect to women's human rights worldwide. Its 1994 Convention on the Prevention, Punishment and Eradication of Violence Against Women influenced the strategies adopted at Beijing. The principles of the Beijing Platform for Action to Eradicate Violence Against Women and to promote economic and social rights, specifically around access to education, have been incorporated into the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. However, despite such advances, it has not yet been shown that jurisprudential norms developed by these bodies have their desired impact on the lives of women in local communities in Latin America. In fact, Current levels of violence against women in most Latin American nations would suggest that they do not. In considering how regional norms translate into local communities, it is useful to consider the theory of localization. This suggests that ideas and practices from international and regional human rights bodies may be adapted by local actors but only in a manner that resonates with values and practices that are already present at the local level. Through the process of vernacularization, ideas and practices will be refined, certain sections may be rejected, and then what is left will be adapted to local meaning. For example, the Inter-American Court's ruling linking commonplace gender-based violence in schools in Ecuador to girls' access to education will have little effect in the local community if girls are not willing to make complaints against a staff member who is sexually violating them because the community still places blame on the girls, shaming them for their victimhood. While it is evident that groundbreaking changes with respect to economic and social rights are occurring at the regional level, it remains to be determined whether these developments will influence communities and hence provide improvement to the lives of women and girls as intended. I contend that although the principles of the Beijing Platform for Action have been incorporated into the jurisprudence of the inter-American system, they have not yet been translated into local communities. In order to determine the lived effects of the regional jurisprudence, further research needs to be conducted. Thank you very much to our three scholars. I think it's unsurprising that the three papers grapple with this difficult question between how much we should celebrate and when we should pack away the celebrations and continue to demand more change. Um, I suppose I situate myself on the more optimistic side and I wanna provide some context to my remarks today, turning back to how Hillary and Louise started us off earlier this morning. I was 14 when 30,000 activists marched on Beijing and Wairu, and it's quite difficult to imagine Beijing for those who weren't there. The internet was in its infancy and obviously social media was nothing of what it is today. And yet thousands of women managed to turn up, be heard, and make something, albeit flawed, beautiful. Women's power as mobilizers come as no surprise. And Adiola in her paper on Nigeria talks about the uprisings of Nigerian women in the 1930s and the 1940s in protest to an attempt to introduce a tax that would discriminate against women who were local traders in the markets. And obviously we know that women's rights activism certainly didn't start in Beijing. And Hillary talked today about the need to celebrate and defer to those people who not only marched in Beijing, but even earlier in Nairobi in 1985, Copenhagen in 1980 and Mexico in 1975. I've been privileged to be part of important moments in women's history, albeit less momentous. I was there at the first universal periodic review in Geneva where women's rights NGOs were really pushing for more space for women's rights issues. And when the UN launched UN Women at the Commission on the Status of Women in New York. 
As you can see from these papers, any discussion of Beijing really requires realism. And I think when the World Economic Forum announced that we were a century away from parity, possibly many um, activists and scholars shrugged. We've been so overwhelmed by this bombardment of negative statistics. We know progress is unsatisfactory. And progress since 2015 has particularly been marginal and slow. So while we need to celebrate the gains that have been made, we know there's no country where men and women are equal. And it's important to wonder if the activists back 25 years ago imagined that prospect, that 25 years down the track, we would still be fighting for equality the way we are today. Worries about Chinese censorship, hostility on LGBTQI rights, and a sense that gender is synonymous with the destruction of the family. You could think I'm talking about today, but in fact, I'm paraphrasing from one of the articles Louise mentioned that has been published by Joanne Sandler and Anne Goetz in the Journal of Gender and Development earlier this year. And in that paper, they're talking about the fears that were on the minds of activists back in Beijing, and yet those fears are very lived today by activists and scholars. So it does seem like a few steps forward, a few steps back. In the minds of these scholars, how much has changed? And I think it's important to start by acknowledging the very different context that we're looking at in terms of Nigeria, India, and Latin America. And yet Adiola Delke, Lindsay stevenson Graf, and Natasha Singh Raghuvanshi all tell stories of slow and uneven progress, backward steps, ingrained inequality, and at times seemingly insurmountable challenges. And I think one of the first things that's really evident across the papers is that despite this overall sense of progress, Beijing's impact is uneven and certain women and girls are definitely being left behind. In her paper on Nigeria, Adiola talks about discrimination on such extensive fronts that it's almost difficult to quantify. And she focuses on the differences in the experiences of women's rights between different Nigerian women and girls. She highlights the particular experiences of women and girls in the north of Nigeria of early marriage in an area where we know there are also huge gender disparities in school completion. So obviously we can see the link between that issue. In India, Natasha speaks of the inadequacy of government policies to actually respond to the specific experiences of Dalit and tribal women and girls. And I think these papers remind us that we need to be cautious when we look at progress in the aggregate. So when we look at measures like the Sustainable Development Goals or other countless and important measures of gender equality, if we look just at the aggregate picture, clearly we're not seeing the level of uneven progress at a country level. Lindsay's paper similarly tells a sobering story of Ecuadorian girl Paola do Rosario Guzman Albertin. Lindsay recounts that Paola was raped, sexually abused by her assistant principal from the ages of 14 to 16, feared she was pregnant, attempted to commit suicide, and instead of receiving urgent medical care, was told she should pray. Now, Paola's story is known to us precisely because it reached the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And in that sense, from a legal perspective, the case is a success. It highlighted the injustices of the uh, Latin American, uh, the Ecuadorian court system in bringing justice to survivors and the failure of the school system to prevent sexual violence. It also speaks very positively on the, on the impact of the internationalization of women's rights because the case was brought to the Inter-American Court due to a partnership between New York-based Centre for Reproductive Rights, who are my former colleagues, and their partner in Ecuador, CEPAM. But obviously, the story has a very sad and sombre end point. And again, it's a reminder of the importance not to just look at progress in aggregate. Latin America is a real success story when we think about progress on school completion rates. And in some countries in Latin America, there are more girls in school than boys. And yet we know that we need to bring an intersectional lens and Beijing called on us to do this back in um, 1995. And while it might have been inadequate in covering a greater level of um, identities and difference, as, as Di Otto so well pointed out this morning when it comes to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, it did help start some of those conversations around intersectionality. The second key observation that I think is really evident in these papers is that the law probably isn't playing the role that it should or could. In my own work, as Louise kindly mentioned in the introduction, I look a lot about the, at the role of the law as a powerful lever to bring about progress on women's rights. You know, the law is a powerful tool to advance women's interests at a national level. And yet there's a, obviously an issue around implementation and Natasha's paper does so well at pointing out the laws and policies in India that protect women's rights on paper but aren't delivering in practice. Natasha names countless bureaucrats who speak about so-called Indian government commitment to women's rights despite the law having a limited impact in practice. 
Now, this conversation around the law as a powerful tool for change in countries like India is a tangible one. And yet in other countries, we are working at the opposite end of the spectrum. And Adiola's paper on Nigeria really speaks to this issue. Nigerian law embeds women's secondary status in a highly patriarchal, heteronormative social structure. Adiola does really well at bringing out some examples. In Adiola's writing, the Nigerian penal code virtually forgives the abuse of a hus by a husband of his wife. Nigerian law allows a Nigerian man to pass on his citizenship to a non-Nigerian wife, but doesn't allow a Nigerian woman to pass on her citizenship to a non-Nigerian husband, bringing us back to Deidre's paper in an earlier session. Uh, an unmarried woman in the police force in Nigeria who's found to be pregnant can be dismissed under the Police Act. So we're seeing this huge discrimination on paper, but also a gap between even good laws, gender responsive laws, and the impact on social and cultural change at a national level. And I think this is not a new issue. Scholars and activists have talked for many years about the need to repeal discriminatory laws and to hasten the pace at which we're enacting gender responsive laws and ensuring they actually bring about change. But I do think this is a conversation that needs to be revisited. How can we fasten the pace at which we're repealing these discriminatory laws and create a legal system that actually allows gender responsive legislation to bring about the positive change that those laws were designed to do? My third observation from all these papers is how all scholars really note the slow progress of local change as a major challenge. And I think this is probably the strongest sentiment running across the three papers. It was ingrained local norms that allowed the sexual abuse of Paola in the Ecuadorian school system. And it's ingrained local norms that act as a barrier in homes and communities we know for women who are victims of abuse to complain and that encourage self-blame. And the sad part about the story of Paola in Ecuador is the same story probably could have been told in Natasha's paper on Nigeria and in Adiola's, pa in Adiola's paper on Nigeria, sorry, and Natasha's paper on India, but was simply a change to the girl's name. So we know that ingrained local norms is a major challenge. And that real respect for women's rights must be owned, felt and led locally. Lindsay in her paper does an excellent job of showing how this can be done by drawing on scholar Sally Engelmary, who sadly passed away earlier this year after years of contributing to how we understand local level change. Local communities can be exposed to global norms such as those outlined in Beijing, but they need to be able to refine these norms for themselves, have a chance to reject these norms and to reframe them to mean something locally. Even the most celebrated court judgments and and the most um, gender responsive legislation needs a local context that is ready for change. My final observations are possibly less observations on the paper and more notes of caution. I think these scholars do an incredible job of bringing out the very lived local experiences of women in these three contexts. At the same time, they focus on the issue of gender-based violence, whether that's violence at home, in the workplace, in communities, or in the case of the Indian paper from Natasha, state-led um, violence under highly um, restrictive national security legislation. I, despite the importance of the issue of gender-based violence, I couldn't help but be wary of the focus on women's bodies. There seems to be this magnetic effect between gender-based violence and women's rights scholarship and activism, and there are many important reasons for focusing on gender-based violence. Yet at the same time, there are risks, and I'm far from the first person to point this out. But I couldn't help but use the opportunity to remind ourselves to be looking when it comes to gender inequality at issues like women's experiences of tax systems that discriminate against them, or how environmental regulations affect women as workers or community members, or exploring the gendered implications of trade, just to name a few examples, or ideally all three of those and the intersection with gender-based violence. I was also reminded when reading these papers of a wonderful paper by Ratna Kapoor in the Melbourne Journal of International Law in 2014. And in Ratna Kapoor's paper, she talks about the Delhi gang rape. So the rape of a young woman in a bus in Delhi that took place in 2012 and really received unprecedented global attention. And in that paper, Ratna Kapoor raises a number of cautions. And I think one of them is relevant in this context. And that's that we need to be mindful as scholars and activists that this focus on gender-based violence in some countries invites the government to exercise even greater control over women's bodies, women's sexualities and women's movements. The second sort of caution I wanted to raise in this panel, because it's focused on country perspectives, is 
the importance to think about gender equality from a global perspective. And again, these scholars do a wonderful job of bringing out these experiences of women in the global south. And you can imagine off the pages of these papers, women's experiences in those three contexts. At the same time, it reminded me of a conversation I had with women's rights activist Sapali Kotagoda when I went to Sri Lanka to interview her a couple of years ago. And Sapali and I had a conversation about um, Sri Lankan men and their portrayal in the media and a conversation she had had with a male bureaucrat in the Sri Lankan Ministry of Labour. And she said to him, all that the world knows of Sri Lankan men is that they cheat on their wives, they're abusive, they're drunkards and they commit incest. Is this how you want us to know Sri Lankan men? And she wanted to push out a counter narrative. So looking at these three papers and thinking about Sepali's comment, I couldn't help but think about our tendency to look at country perspectives just from the global south. And thankfully, we were reminded this morning from Kate Jenkins and also the wonderful panel moderated by Fran about how much progress there is needed to be made in a, in a country, a global north country like Australia, where there is so far to go. And while I don't want to butcher Gayatri Spivak's really beautiful, beautiful nuanced writing, she does remind us that we want to make sure that we're not limiting our lens to discussing white men saving brown women from brown men. So I think it was a reminder that just a few days ago, Australia reached a terrible milestone, which was the 48th woman who has been murdered in a context of domestic violence at home. So when we think about gender inequality and country perspectives, we certainly need to make sure we're looking at the progress made in the global north and global south. And so often we're trying to remind ourselves to remember the global south, but today I'm saying let's remember the progress that needs to be made in the global north as well. So I can see that my time is almost up. We have the privilege of having Natasha, who will be in the chat room later today, taking questions on her paper in India. But I do want to finish on a, on a final note. You know, despite their notes of cautions, these three scholars are still optimistic and they still remind us that it is worthwhile to try to work within the system we have to make sure that the women's rights norms that were set in Beijing and all these other momentous moments in history still help bring about local change in women's lives on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ramona, thank you so much for that wonderfully sort of uh, imaginative way that you sort of responded to all the papers and also I think with your very important words at the end about uh, remembering. I think in Australia particularly we tend to think of women's rights as something that happens over there somewhere else and it's really important to be reminded that uh, we need to look at ourselves first. So thank you very much and thank you to all those, the three wonderfully different papers and as you said that there will be a chance after the next uh, session to actually meet with some of them. So many warm thanks Ramona. Thank you Hilary.